Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that we can look to you during these moments, and we ask that you would speak with our hearts and communicate your truth in a way that makes a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Please sit. Because Pastor Ken asked me to do so, I will tell you who I am, because you might wonder whether I just kind of wandered off the street here. <laughs> but uh, my name is Mutua, and uh, I am from Kenya. My wife, Stephanie, and I have been worshiping at this church. We've been members of this church, um, you know, part of this AIC family for 11 years. Surprising, because some people don't we kind of blend in, so that's why you don't notice. <laughs> but it's a joy to be able to bring God's word. And uh, we will be looking at this third chapter of Ephesians, the second part of that chapter that was read to us. Are you familiar with uh, Willie Sutton? Yes. <laughs> Willie Sutton was actually a bank robber. So... But he is well-known bank robber, and what he is best known for is a story that probably never really happened, is that he was interviewed about why he robbed banks. He was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> Isn't that deep? <laughs> and you think about wanting to really walk with God, you want to go where the stuff is. Where is God laying out the stuff that you can access? What is God offering and where can I get the maximum benefit of all that I have in my relationship with Christ? That is what Paul is bringing to us in this passage as he prays for the Ephesians. And uh, what I'd like to do is to look at three things today with you. What God has done by first of all seeing the big picture of what God is doing. If we do not see our little experience of God in the context of his big, what the big thing that God is doing, we will miss out on so much that is ours as our heritage, as our children of God. The big agenda of God defines my experience of God. Then we see Paul understanding that, starting to pray that those big things would somehow find home in the lives of the Ephesians, praying this big truth into experience. And lastly, we'll look at how Paul zeroes in on being empowered by God's love to know God's love. Being empowered by God's love to know God's love. So the big agenda, praying that into experience, and then being empowered by God's love to know God's love. So what has God done? Three things that I'd like to focus with you on around this big agenda of God. And I'd like to call the first that we see here the great redemption story. To know what story am I in? Remember Lucy in the Chronicles of Narnia, the, the lion, the, the witch, and the wardrobe. She walks into this wardrobe and she finds herself in another world. And in a sense, that's what we are experiencing in our walk with God. We are in another world, and we sometimes fail to recognize that we are part of a much bigger story than our little story. Good, bad, or ugly, we are part of something much bigger than what we think. We are part of the great redemption story rather than our, our little preoccupations. So we must not reduce the gospel to a sort of life insurance policy, that that's what it's all about. Or a self-improvement program, the help, the gospel helps me to live a better life. That is so little compared with what God is offering us, or some sort of religious practices. My little story only makes sense when I see it in the light of God's big story, the big picture. So Paul, I'd like to walk with you for, and look at a, a, a few examples of that. Paul talks about the benefits that we get as children of God by being part of the family of God. Chapter 1, verse 4, he says, God has chosen us. Now that is an immediate benefit to know that God chose us. It is so huge that if you can only camp on that, that would be worth, and there's more, but that would be worth everything in the gospel. 
but I warn you, there's so much more. But if we come to that particular one, you think about children. We've just sent off our children here. They are children who are wanted. They are not just an accident. They matter. And for a person to know I was wanted, God, I didn't just happen into the family of God just because I was in a bad shape one day and God was in a good mood and the two came together. It is because God wanted us. Paul says in Ephesians 1 that God chose us before the creation of the world. We didn't, he didn't just choose me because I was the next one. There was nobody else that was willing to respond. He had thought of me before the creation of the world. What is that all about? What we are seeing here is that the experience of being a chosen one by God is set in the context of the bigger plan of God where you are chosen before the creation of the world. The experience you have of God becomes much more real when you experience the great purposes of God. In chapter 1, verse 7, he talks about in him, us having redemption in him, the forgiveness of sins. Being a forgiven sinner, being forgiven and knowing that God will hold no, nothing against me, that is mind-boggling. But there is so much more. That is set in the context of the redemption story. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. And I thought I was getting a good deal. God then says, this is part of a much bigger story. What I am doing in you is, to, is part of my effort to bring all my commitment and to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. If you thought you knew the gospel, then you start looking at what Paul says here you will discover that you're barely a beginner. I feel just overwhelmed by the amazing treasure that is held for us in this passage. And then he talks, okay, another one. Chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. He talks about being seated in the heavenly places. We all know chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship created by God in Christ Jesus for good works which we should walk in. And that is wonderful. But then you place it in the context of the passage and always in the Bible, read it in context. The context reveals to us that God has seated us in the heavenly realms. And you think, what is that all about? You, being seated in the heavenly realms, your experience of being uh, saved is because God is doing something much greater. Chapter 3, which is our passage today, he talks about Gentiles being heirs with Israel. And then he says, so that, it's not just that Jews and Gentiles are together, they, it, and, and, and everybody is happy and it's all hunky-dory. There is a bigger story. He says, it is so that through the church, God might manifest his authority, the wonder of his beauty to the principalities and powers. You're on display to forces that you never even understand. We are part of something so much greater. So when we understand the great redemption story, then we begin to understand why Paul, when he prays this prayer, he, he just falls on his knees. He just can't believe what he is seeing. And we get... We sometimes have a gospel light that is kind of just to get you over the threshold into heaven. And you think, what gospel is that? A little gospel is no gospel at all. This whole story of God, the great redemption story, then we see Paul saying, the reason why God is doing this not only is it part of a bigger story, but the reason why he is doing it is for his own glory. For my blessing, yes, but really for his glory. For himself, when he gets the glory, I get the blessing. If I try to have a blessing that is somehow divorced from the great glory of God, I then wonder, why is God such a confusing God? Because I am not preoccupied with that which preoccupies him. 
It's not possible to even grasp the magnitude of what we've been swept up into. So Paul talks about the revelation of the divine mystery and now the receiving of the divine fullness. His intent, according to, to Paul, was that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. God is doing something so much greater. Do you perceive it? Or you might think, well, I don't think that connects with me. I can understand it intellectually. It doesn't move me. That's why Paul says, I fall on my knees and I ask God to give you the power to understand the significance of this great story. He says, you never get it just by reading more and thinking about it. It's got to be a God, a God thing. God has to reveal this to you. Some of you have heard me preach before. If you have, I've probably, you've probably heard me use this illustration. Forgive me for using it again. But when I was leading the navigator work in Africa, I work with the navigators, but when I was leading the navigator work, we were one time planning to gather all the country leaders for our work from across Africa. And it is expensive to travel in Africa. Every moment mattered. We wanted to make sure every time we met for five days, every day we wanted to fill it with good stuff and uh, I remember one member of our team uh, my friend Bulus Bosan who happens to be here today uh, he, but Bulus told us as a team he said hey guys why don't we take three days just to focus on God of those five days and then we can use the other two days for business and uh, you know we are believers we are Christians who who can argue with prayer so we didn't quite know how to deal with this. And, but, but because Bulus is so persuasive, we agreed. But I'll tell you what. Three days focused on God and God alone with no other agenda, not, not even a prayer request. We just wanted to focus on, on God. To begin to enter into the bigger picture of what God is doing. We did more in those two days that were left over than we had normally done in five days. Brothers and sisters, this is a God thing. God reveals to us the magnitude of what he is doing, the bigger picture. And then he says, I want to bring you to experience all of this together with others. God's new family. Verse 15, I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. It is because the Gentile Christians have been included fully into the body of Christ that Paul prays for them to experience the full range of spiritual benefits that are theirs as children of God. Because they've been included, Paul prays this big prayer. The better we understand this family name, the f because every f he is the father of this family, and every family derives its name from him, the more we understand the family we are a part of, the, more, the better we understand, the more we'll, we'll be involved in the business of that family. And if we find ourselves kind of, you know, um, hesitating to throw ourselves fully into all that God invites us into, it's because we didn't get it. And Paul says, God, reveal to them, show them, what this is all about. And so Paul prays this truth into their experience. He could have just preached at them and he did. This is the church where Paul spent the most time, three years in Ephesus. But instead of just reminding them and reminding them and reminding them, which he was going to do and he did, he actually went to, he went to do business with God by praying these truths into his life, their lives. I bow my knees, he says, in prayer to God. It's more than just that he knelt, it's that he prostrated himself. See, the, or the ordinary Jewish attitude in prayer was standing, with the hands stretched out and the palm upward. Paul's prayer for the church is so intense. This is so important for them to get this. He knows, he says, God, this is so huge. 
How can these people get it? And he says, I just fall on my knees before you. I fall before you. He casts himself face down before God in agony of passionate request. See, people think that we are in the land of the living on the way to the land of the dying. I heard this one, I can't remember who from. But we th people think that. But when we have guys, God open our eyes, we understand we are really in the land of the dying on the way to the land of the living. We are where life is. And we get so sucked into this that God Start, we start living with different priorities. In chapter 1, Paul had a prayer. You remember when we went over that. He prayed for them that they might know. He prayed for their understanding. Now he is praying that they might have, they might enter into that which they do know. You might know it, and it makes no difference. Paul says, God caused these people to actually have as a present experience that which is theirs by, by birthright. He prays for their inner strength that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith. He prays for love that they might have the power to grasp the, the, the full extent of God's love. And he prays for the fullness of God in their lives. Now it's interesting because this is kind of like a Trinitarian prayer because Paul pr prays for them to have the strength of the Spirit, the indwelling of Christ, and the fullness of God. He is saying the only way that we can get this truth that we have prayed about in chapter 1 to be lived out in their lives is if God steps in. And he says the Spirit of God must be at work giving them strength. The Christ himself dwelling in them, and the Father coming in his fullness into their lives. This is important enough that God doesn't just send a messenger. He shows us himself. And so we get empowered to know God's love in order to know his love. Paul prays in verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Isn't it interesting? He says you need power in order to understand love. When my wife and I fell in love with one another, at least I can speak for myself. She is here, she can tell you about her. But my, on my, my experience of this was I thought when I fell in love with her, I didn't need a lot of power to fall in love with her. It was, just, it was just a joy. It's just, why would power be needed in order for you to know love? No, it's not a rhetorical question. Tell me. Okay. <laughs> why would you need power? He says you need power in order to understand the love. Well, it must be, among other things, that Satan understands that if you get to understand the love of God, something happens. And it is a place of battle. You need power to understand this love. Because there is a resistance to it. There's resistance probably from within. There's resistance from without. And it takes power to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then he says, I pray in verse um, 18 and 19, I pray that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to all the fullness of God together with God's people. Anybody who tries to experience the Christian life by being disconnected from the people of God misses the point. This is where God is at work. Willie Sutton broke into banks because that's where the money was. Where the people of God are is where God is pouring out an experience of himself. And as we learn that that's where God is at work, we take seriously our, our place in the body of Christ. I remember when I was doing student ministry, we would, um, 
I, um, when I would be counseling with uh, students, and young men especially, struggling with issues of purity. It was a joy to point them to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Paul says, So ye shun youthful passions, and aim at righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. Doing it together with other people, God does something. So he is saying, experiencing God's love together with all the Lord's holy people being, helps you to understand the love and on the, of God in ways that strengthen you and that transform you. See, brothers and sisters, what is at stake here is not your happiness, not, your, no, 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 not just God doing what you want him to do. There's something much bigger than than that it's here. Jesus said something bigger than Solomon is here. Something much bigger than Jonah. Something bigger than the biggest thing that you ever saw God do. God is accomplishing something much bigger. As I enter into that arena of what God is doing, the big thing, then my needs are met in ways that I never thought of before. So we learn to be worshippers. That's why we worship God. Because he is worthy of everything and we get sucked in to the bigger picture of what God is doing and we learn how to pray. Those who do not know how to worship God don't know how to pray because they come with their, with their laundry list, their shopping list, and they are sort of expecting God to salute and say, um, you, yeah, you can have them because you got all the right formulas. The prayer of Paul brings us into the bigger picture of what God is doing. So in closing, we experience the love of God. As to experience the love of God, we need people and we need power. Church is not optional. God gets the glory when Jew and Gentile do this together and he will not give his glory to another. He who is forgiven much, loves much. So experiencing the love of God brings us to a place where we understand how deeply loved we are. Jesus prayed in John 14, verse 13, a prayer that helps us to understand why God answers prayer. He prayed the prayer, but he explained why God would answer prayer. Why would his father answered, answer his, his prayers? And it says this. This is Jesus praying. I will do whatever you ask in my name. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples about prayer. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Did you hear that? I will do whatever you ask in my name. I will answer your prayers so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See, Jesus is committed to glorifying his Father. Come what may, he will bring glory to his Father. And this passage, he says, I will get to accomplish that glorification of my Father by answering some prayers. As I answer your prayers, I give glory to my Father. The agenda here is not just about your needs. It's something much bigger. By answering our prayers, he gets to glorify the Father. And if we do not understand the great purposes of God, we'll be praying um, at cross purposes with, with, with what God is seeking to do. And so, this passage today helps us to enter into the unknowable love of God through prayer. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you want us to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. We don't quite get it, how you can invite us to know something that cannot even be known. But we thank you that as we pursue you, you draw us in by your love. And I pray that you really help us, Father, to have a hunger that this would be true of us. 
I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>